everyone, and thanks for checking in again for our monthly EPH focus series. Today, I'm joined by Roger Townsend, one of our EPH consultants. Uh, Roger had over eight years of experience as executive director at Magnus Steer and a total, year, uh, a total experience of 40 plus years in the automotive industry, especially in regards to product development. And we will be talking a bit about um, the changing automotive industry, you know, with the transition that we're seeing currently from ICE to electric vehicles and how that affects the industry uh, and the different players within the industry. So great to have you here today, Roger. Um, pleasure talking to you. And maybe tell us a bit about yourself. Who are you? What have you done so far in your professional career? Sure. Well, thanks for the uh, opportunity, Danielle, to discuss what is a you know a key topic for the industry with with EPH. I think I have that just under forty years experience, and and what I bring really is experience in body engineering, vehicle integration, and leadership of new product development programs. That, that's been my core experience. During that time, I've been very fortunate to, to work on some, some very major body and vehicle integration projects for well-known global OEMs, both in Europe uh, and in Asia uh, and in North America. And I've directed global engineering functions for, for globally recognized auto suppliers. And, uh, as you know now, as a member of the EPH Expert Network, I'm really acting as an independent consultant, helping our clients really drive innovation, develop lean and robust product development processes, providing insights into body and vehicle engineering trends, and then developing resultant new product development plans and technology strategies that are going to be needed for the future. Amazing, yeah, and I can say, I know like from experience, uh that you helped a lot of our clients uh, very accelerate their projects. Um, kind of like I mentioned before today, is a bit about talking about the transition that we're, or not just currently, but over the last five, 10 years, uh, have been seeing within the automotive industry. Um, there's a strong push towards electrification, um, so many new players entering the market, um, and also obviously the, the traditional OEMs um, that have to adapt to the changing situation. So, you personally, what changes do you currently see in the automotive industry and um, what effects does that have on, uh, on the industry overall? Yeah, I think you, you picked up immediately on probably what is, I believe, the most important question for the auto industry in my lifetime. But the really fundamental transition from internal combustion engine or ICE technologies to, to, to full bears, to battery electric vehicles, and, and also other alternate propulsion systems, and really understanding the scale of change that will bring to the industry. I think that thus far, we've seen quite a lot of debate around things like battery technologies, motor technologies, power management, due to the potential industry disruption factors of, of, of new EV startups. And in fact, EPH, has an article on battery technology trends that you can find on their website from their, from their March focus article talking about some trends in battery technology. Yes, exactly. So um, if anyone wants to go more into that battery direction, um, check out that article like Roger mentioned on the website or on LinkedIn. Um, but kind of from what you just mentioned with those changes that are currently happening, obviously with change there's always new opportunities, but um, also new challenges that are introduced into a company or an entire industry. So from your perspective, what do you think are the biggest challenges? Yeah, I think, I think the big takeaways for me, uh, Daniel, are the fact that firstly, I'd say just accepting the industry's moved on from a discussion or a paradigm asking ourselves if EVs will gain market traction and if they'll move on. The paradigm shifted now to discussion of how fast and how quickly will we have to react. And obviously there's some headwinds like charging technologies and infrastructure and battery costs, but there's also strong forces driving change and especially regulatory change in Europe and Asia that's really gonna drive a lot of that transition. 
so the, the first takeaway is the paradigm's moved, not from if, but how, how fast now will be the change. And I think secondly, the realization that the change has the potential to impact every component of the vehicle not just the, but the, the, the obvious motor and the battery technologies but chassis and in my case body but also apart from all the component systems the very way we design and develop vehicles and how we need to evolve the new product development um, systems for evs how we partner and in ultimately through to potentially the how we change even the value structure of the industry <laughs> Yeah, I think some super interesting observations. Now, I know that you, also from the experience you have, um, come a lot from the sector of body structure engineering. And uh, when we look at the technical and operational implications um, within body structure engineering, what are some of the challenges that you see that you think uh, major players and also new players in the industry um, will have to, to tackle over the next few years and decades maybe? I, um, I recently uh, wrote a white paper on this topic highlighting some of the technical and operational challenges and you can find that on the ETH uh, website. But to pick up on a couple initially of some of the technical challenges that I talked about in the article, I think I'd highlight crash, crash safety and weight as a couple of the key technical challenges. And from my background in body engineering, you know, the body structure of the vehicle has always had a very fundamental role in its contribution to crash safety performance. For, for the body structure, simplistically, it's really a challenge of energy management and how we manage the kinetic energy of the crash through the work done in very intentional design of deformation structures of the vehicle, the loads and the crush paths or the load paths and, and, and the, and the crum crumple zones that we use to manage the energy of the crash to reduce the forces on the occupant and key vehicle system. As you mentioned, that, 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 that challenge brings about some real opportunities and challenge. Mm -hmm. As we remove the internal combustion engine and, and the fuel tank, that has the potential to open up some package space opportunities to allow us to really optimize those crash structures. But also the challenge it brings is the, the size and location mm -hmm. of the battery pack really brings challenges, particularly for things like side impact, where mm -hmm. the location of the tray relative to the side of the vehicle gives us very little room to absorb crash energy. And, and brings about a significant challenge for, for, for those crash modes. So do you, like now talking a lot about safety features also, do you think it's going to be, because I know especially for a lot of uh, electric vehicles and new players are coming to the market, they're focusing on different material as well. Um, you now a lot of sustainable and uh, renewable materials or recycled materials, do you see this as a problem when it comes to safety features, um, especially when we look at chassis, or is this something we're saying, you know, the, the development of these chassis is just changing and adapting to the materials that it doesn't have an impact on, on safety features? Now, that's a great question because I think um, body engineering has fundamentally been a lot about safety, but the, the prevailing paradigm for materials has been the evolution to a multi-material world. And that's really been in pursuit of lower weight vehicles, whilst delivering the required safety performance, really delivering lower weight driven by emissions and fuel regulations. That's been the real driver of weight. The penalties contained in emissions legislation has really subsidized low weight technology. But of course, with the transition to EVs, the subject of weight and then hence um, material selection has been, well, what's the value of weight for an EV with no tailpipe emission? Mm -hmm. Those subsidies have gone away. And the contribution of lower weight to things like vehicle range is, is less direct than it was in an ICE world where the relationship to emissions was well understood. 
and particularly the value proposition of competing technologies like stop start, low friction engines due to hybridization, and then the value of weight, which was derived from that, was well understood. We're now going into a world where weight may be of less significance, and especially because of energy recovery technologies, um, the value of weight to range is less per persuasive. However, that doesn't mean that multi-material world that you implied has gone away. It's just it, we, we used to look for low weight materials and manage the cost and material performance characteristics to seek to manage around those. Now we're looking to really exploit the material characteristic differences like strength and stiffness and energy absorption and, and actually manage around the weight impacts. So it's subtly changed. So I think we're still in a multi-material world but driven by really seeking out differences in material characteristics rather than just weight differences. And I think that's so interesting right now uh, in the automotive industry. You know, it's not just a change of saying, hey, let's put an electric battery into the car and then we're all good. There's basically every aspect of, of the car as we know it is kind of being rethought and redesigned. And it's an ever-changing industry. I mean, it, it always has been. Um, but I think that's super interesting at the moment to, to see how many different factors um, come into it and that it's really not just about batteries, but so much more um, that needs to be obviously put together to get an entire car and, and have it kind of uh, work within the regulations we see and also obviously within um, the changes that the customers want to see. Process development is also something that's really undergoing a big change at the moment because obviously there's so many new things that are being implemented, new processes, so that entire development stage obviously needs to change as well. Um, what are maybe some changes here that you see for the coming years? The change from um, ICE to EVs is not only going to challenge the, the technical delivery aspects of programs, but the way we actually organize and evolve the new product development process itself. And as I talked about things like crash and weight on the technical side, here I'd really highlight things like collaboration intensity and rapidly changing cost structures. I think, you know, the industry has always had a very collaborative process, um, both internally across company functions and the extended enterprise and the supply base and other stakeholders. But I think as we go into an EV world, it's going to be collaboration on steroids. You know, we're going to see traditional OEMs needing to collaborate with new EV startups and things like technology access and maybe accelerate scaling. We're going to see new EV startups that need to create whole new ecosystems for their own development, their own process, their own collaboration and, and creating their supply bases. For, for traditional suppliers, we're also, they're also looking to, to maybe change their product lineup in extreme cases. Their products may just be negated with the transition to, to EVs and they're in a whole re re reinvention phase of the company. And then I think we're also going to see a lot of OEMs look to spread the cost of development. So increased collaboration between traditional suppliers to, to reduce the high cost of development. And also a change in make-buy mix. We'll see some traditional OEMs potentially exit powertrain and transmission manufacture to be replaced by external buys for motors and batteries and motor controllers. So you, you, you're going to see a mix there. And so collectively, I see you know we're going to be collaborating on steroids in the EV world compared to ICE. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's what's so interesting right now as well. Just like you mentioned, there's so many players who are entering the market so many new um, startups on the supplier side, obviously also on the manufacturer side. Uh, I mean, Tesla by now can't really be uh, seen as a startup anymore, even though they haven't been there for so long. But so many other players um, who are now manufacturing new electric vehicles who have never really been in automotive manufacturing before, um, which obviously makes the market very interesting again. And with that many new players entering the market, what are maybe some advantages you see more on the traditional side, you know, um, OEMs like BMW, Mercedes, Volkswagen, 
Um, but then maybe also the, the advantages that some of the newer, younger players might have compared to that. And obviously, you know, vice versa again, what are maybe the different challenges that the traditional players in the industry will face compared to younger startups that have just entered the space within the last couple of years? Yeah, I think it's interesting in that the, the change to EV is going to affect all those players, as, as you've just um, illustrated. You can see that both traditional and new OEMs will need to you know, learn new development capabilities, whether it's really the in-depth learning of new materials and necessary to use them in, in crash safety applications, or for traditional OEMs, it may be developing their MPD processes that although they provide very good definitions of, of an MPD, new product development process, they were tended, they were ice driven. And so they're probably inadequate in their description and templates and tools and techniques for the EV world where, for example, battery tray development um, crosses so many functional skills. You know, we're going to find the knowledge of the battery, the electronics in the, in the electronic groups, but often the structure itself, of, often it's a, it's a part of the crash structure of the vehicle, and those skills and material and the manufacturing technologies are more likely to be found in the body part of the business. So just understanding how they evolve their MPD process descriptions and milestones and collaboration descriptions is going to be key to integrating these new technologies. And I think for, for a lot of new suppliers, a lot of new technology suppliers, learning how to work with established OEMs is going to be important. And that's where I believe that the MPD process itself and how it evolves is so important to provide what I call that common language to allow those collaborators to discuss because it defines the process, it sets expectations, it implies responsibilities and it really governs the process through to it could be formed the basis of contractual arrangements. Mm -hmm. So the MPD process is so important to provide a common language to allow us to understand each other and manage our programs. All the changes that, that you've already mentioned and that you, you see already existing or that will come into place within the next few years, how do you think um, basically all players in the industry can kind of tackle those? Well, what can be done um, especially when we also talk about product process development to really further those developments and make sure that um, we have that continuous improvement. I think I'm seeing the need to change and evolve the new product development system to handle different types of collaboration, different intensities of collaboration and integrate new um, technical solutions into the process. But that magnitude of change is really um, driving and being helped by taking some time to do things such as role playing the development process prior to its full execution and, and doing what I call a project pre-mortem as opposed to a post-mortem and lessons learned. Let's try to bring that whole process up front and through that role playing exercise do a pre-mortem of identifying any gaps in the descriptions in our new product development processes that don't adequately describe the decision points, the stage gates, um, or the collaborations needed to deliver new technologies. And that can be helpful to, to try to anticipate some of the gaps we're going to have to fill in our business processes. And uh, maybe since uh, obviously you have some experience also um, with projects of some of our clients, of the EPH clients, um, do you see those gaps? You think that there's a um, good chance for the future? Or let me put this a different way. Do you think there's a lot of good opportunities for um, OEMs and also suppliers to bring in external freelance knowledge to close those gaps, to make sure that there's, like you say, pre-mortem product development um, kind of is sufficiently done because a lot of times there's, there's missing time not enough capacity to do these things so um where do you see there for a lot of freelancers and independent consultants the chance to support the traditional players and also like i mentioned new players more effectively yeah i'm i'm, I'm very optimistic about the industry you know evolving new uh, 
new approaches and new uh, means of collaborating to deliver EVs. I see a lot of value in independent consultancies taking that independent position to, to help suppliers and OEMs develop their plans and particularly their collaboration plans and process evolutions necessary to robustly deliver EVs. I think we can help find that essential balance be, between the, the new EV world that needs to challenge traditional OEM paradigms and conventional wisdoms. Those need to be challenged, but also some of those conventional wisdoms need to be there. And some of the experience we can bring is help explain why they're there, what can be challenged, and that the experience itself can lead to shortcuts built through knowledge um, rather than gaps in knowledge. So I think there is a, a key role for, for independent consultancy help to, to manage both tradition, to help both traditional players and new EV startups and suppliers. You mentioned that the collaboration between more traditional OEMs and, and top tier suppliers and startups that, that enter uh, the market um, needs to continue to grow and to become stronger. Um, that we come more into this, like you said, collaboration on steroids uh, models, so to speak. But how can that also maybe change cost structures? What chances do you see there? Maybe you could elaborate a bit on that. Sure. I think one of the things we're seeing with the transition to EVs is obviously the, the dominant cost of the battery is really changing the variable cost structure of the vehicle. The battery cost is much higher than the powertrain and associated systems, I systems it's replacing. And although we're seeing some cost save potential with a more simplified assembly, perhaps, of these new modules, still the pervasive element at the moment is the cost of the battery itself. And whilst we see some cost reduction um, potential, it's really driving all systems of the vehicle to take a really aggressive to design to cost approach and really make sure we understand value of, of every system of the vehicle. So picking the right solution. That's complicated also by the fact we haven't got years of experience with product sales volumes in the BEV space. So predicting volumes is going to be difficult. So I think what we're also going to see in our MPD process is a greater emphasis on really understanding those design material process affinities with particular volumes, but also valuing volume flexibility and designing manufacturing processes and solutions where we deeply understand how we're going to scale them if we need to, what are the volume breakpoints, and how we value that flexibility of being mm -hmm. able to change volume and the timelines needed to bring on uh, uh, additional volume or reduce it. Mm -hmm. Um, it seems to me like with the kind of opinions you're giving, talking about collaboration, flexibility, that the entire industry just needs to learn to behave a bit more agile, right? That there needs to be a higher level of flexibility to also adapt to new technologies, to adapt to new trends within the market. Because I remember like in a traditional sense, a lot of the, especially like German manufacturers, what they would do is they would kind of have that seven year cycle where they would bring an updated version of, let's say for BMW, the, the two series or the three series. Um, but it seems to me that we will be getting, just like we saw this with an iPhone, for example, um, newer products faster and faster with kind of every year or decades that might go by because there's just so many changes and you need to stay, especially when moving to more of a software product into that flexible space of kind of giving the customer an up-to-date product, right? I think that, that's true. I think in, in all the work we do, the value of flexibility will be, will be more highly valued. And I think you pointed out there, the, the new startups and the EVs, they don't have legacy past prior ICE investments. They don't have that momentum drag on R&D choosing processes and materials that fit their current infrastructure. So we're seeing some fast moving EVs making first principle decisions without that legacy environment and legacy ecosystem and responsibility. Yeah, uh, I couldn't agree more. I think um, 
that's why it's so 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 interesting to kind of watch the automotive industry at the moment because I think no one really knows where exactly we'll go yet. At least it seems like it, and I think there's just a lot of um, open room for opportunities and um, a lot of like we see players who have a good opportunity to kind of uh, be part of that change within the industry. And we'll see how OEMs react to modeling the profitability even of their programs. Even that will change because of the value of the services derived from connectivity of vehicles, which has not typically been factored into the P&L forecasting of vehicle um, uh, financial performance. So really understanding how we make value choices and profitability choices across an extended enterprise will also challenge how we evolve that process within our MPD processes. Yeah, and I think especially now since it seems to me like the automotive in, or let's say a car itself is more and more moving towards a software product, you know, with a lot of also when we when we talk about stuff like autonomous driving and um, all the connectivity within the car, you know, it's more and more becoming a software product. And I think it's, uh, from my opinion, in those areas, that collaboration um, between traditional players and also new players, especially that also maybe come more from a software background, if we see, you know, like Google or Apple kind of entering into the electric vehicle space, um, that collaboration is kind of um, inevitable here. And that collaboration will just lead to all parties um, getting faster to where they want to be with this. Because I know, especially for electric vehicles, there's always this big, big discussion about charging stations and how to kind of like change the, um, sort of electricity set up within or the infrastructure within the cities or entire countries to even make this possible. Uh, the last question I kind of would like to ask because I always ask this everyone that I talk to about electric vehicles um, or the industry around it. Do you see the future of automobiles within electric vehicles? Um, or do you think something else like potentially hydrogen or later on maybe uh, solar will be the dominating factor for the industry going forward? Yeah, I, I think in the, in the midterm, I think it will be EVs that um, give us the majority of our evolution to a, to a, a, a zero emissions future. But I think longer term, there are alternate powertrain technologies, hydrogen example that you've mentioned, which we're going to need as well. We're going to, we're going to need multiple technologies. We, we're going to see still a little bit of development in, in efficiencies for ICE engines as OEMs phase out ICE and comply with current regulation. But we're going to need EVs, hydrogen, and potentially a whole array of other battery technologies that are going to be needed to really gain momentum to get us to towards a carbon-free future. Amazing. I think that's exactly where we need to go as well. It's never going to be possible to have 100% just electric, just hydrogen, to find that nice hybrid combination, basically. Um, I feel like at least at the moment will be the way to go, but we'll see kind of where, how it continues. Um, but this is definitely a great discussion today, very, very interesting insights. Um, I myself, and I consider myself kind of like, I know a few things about automotive, but if, a lot of things also from a different point of view today that I didn't know before. So thanks a lot for those great insights. Um, it was a pleasure talking to you. And uh, for everyone who's interested to learn even a bit more about the topics uh, Roger mentioned today and that we discussed, um, as he said before, there will be an article uh, on our website and also on LinkedIn that will be published shortly after this interview. It might already be uh, online depending on when you watch this. So go check it out for a few more, uh, few more insights. And obviously, whenever you uh, need Roger's help, reach out to us and uh, I'm sure we can set something up. So thanks a lot, Roger. And uh, yeah, have a great day and thanks for taking the time. Thank you, Danielle. A pleasure.